Hi there, this is Richard Henshaw and you're listening to Sonic Perspectives. and other beings of the universe. I am Rodrigo Altaf reporting once again for Sonic Perspectives. We are bringing you today a chat with guitar virtuoso Richard Henschel of Haken fame. He has a solo album called Cocoon, soon to be released, and we're going to tell you all about it. Richard, are you ready? I am ready. <laughs> Let me start by saying this interview is long overdue because I was supposed to talk to you uh, when Vector, the Haken album, was about to be released, but I think your son got sick on the day of the interview, so I spoke with Charlie instead. I'm happy we finally get a chance to talk. Yeah, speaking of my son, you can probably hear him, actually, I, in the background there. I can, <laughs> I can. Screaming and shouting. But, um, it's, yeah, it's great to finally get a chance to chat, and, yeah, really excited. Yeah. Tell us about the new album, Cocoon, and my first question is, did you write this collection of tracks through the years, or did you have writing sessions specifically for this album? Well, firstly, it's a solo effort, and it's, yeah, it's been on the, on the back burner for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, around about the time we finished The Mountain in Haken, we decided to push the music in a new direction and decided to write collaboratively. Um, and that really freed up a lot of time for me because up until then I did a lot of the writing for Haken. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I had a lot of free time. I decided to, to work on something outside of Haken um, and work on some new, fresher ideas. Um, but also around the same time, I formed a new band called uh, The Nova Collective with uh, Dan Briggs from Between the Buried and Me. Uh-huh. So that took up a lot of my attention around then. Uh, so I put the whole solo thing on the back burner and then returned to it about three years ago. And I've just been kind of working at it and chiseling away at the ideas in the, the small pockets of time I've had in between Haken tours and the various other things that I've been doing. Um, but yeah, over the last year, I've really pushed it and pushed it. And uh, the end result is what you can hear now. Yeah, and I noticed a lot of ideas on the album uh, could be used on a Haken album, given the right arrangement, of course. Uh, why did you feel the need to express yourself solo and outside of the confines of Haken? I guess it's um, Haken is a collective vision now. So with Affinity and Vector, we, uh, we, we decided to write as a band, and a, a piece of all of us is on those albums. Um, and I don't know, it just felt right to try something completely separate from Haken. Um, obviously, I still write in Haken, so a lot of my ideas are inside that mix. Mm. Uh, but these ideas felt like there was something separate, and they all form um, almost like a collective group of ideas that form one idea. Um, and they're all, they're all kind of tied together with uh, musical hooks, but also um, like a lyrical theme that ties things together. Mm-hmm. So it all kind of made sense to just put them all on this one album. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm totally, totally on the Haken train, still write a lot of music for Haken, and that's my main focus, and it always will be. I see. And very often a solo album is a sign of tension between band members, but I can tell it's not the case here, because you have Ross and Connor from Haken on the album as well. Oh yeah, I'm sure all of uh, my bandmates are really um, happy that I've been <laughs> uh, pursuing other avenues, and everyone does their own thing outside of Haken. I see. Um, and yeah, Ross is on the album. He, he sings on the track Twisted Shadows, mm-hmm. uh, which is the, the single that I first released a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, and obviously Connor is on the whole album. So he, he really kind of like kind of nailed his parts there. And I couldn't think of a better bass player mm-hmm. to, to have on the album. And he was happy to do it. And yeah, and I, I've spoken to the rest of the guys and they're all happy for me to uh, to the music. Yeah. And what's the meaning of the album title for you, Cocoon? So it's all about those watershed moments that really make you perceive things in an entirely different way. Um, quite, I quite like the analogy of being in a semi-dark room and then so- suddenly someone switches the light switch on and you get to see all these objects and things that were surrounding you before but you couldn't quite make them out. Uh, I quite like that idea. 
so the the cocoon is a metaphor really and a, there's a protagonist in the album who's kind of progressively getting closer to breaking out of this cocoon and eventually at the end of the album he, he breaks out um and then each song has its own theme under that blanket theme um but that's the general overarching theme of the, of the album Oh, I see. And I love the, the cover, too, which has this weird figure, kind of like a ghost made of smoke sort of thing. Who was behind the cover and what's the concept of it? How does it tie in with the music? Well, I'm very lucky to have uh, my wife doing the artwork for me. Oh, um, cool. So, oh. Yeah, so we can talk through things. And um, basically, we went back and forth for, for a while, for about a year or so, because I, mean, I was uh, working on the music and I was being quite slow and pretty anal about things. So she had a lot of time to kind of sketch out loads of different studies and ideas. Um, and yeah, I guess this one, a lot of her uh, artwork has the theme of hands and being pulled down and um, hands form bigger images. So if you look closely, the image is formed of loads of smaller hands making up this cocoon-like image. And then the hands are pulling down this figure. Um, and then, so that was just one of the studies that she came out with. And that, she actually did that whilst I was on tour, and she sent it through to me. And I was like, wow, this is, this is incredible. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we just knew that that was going to be the cover because it had a, an iconic um, image. And, yeah, there's a, the inside booklet has got a whole bunch of similar themed um, artwork. Okay, very cool. And the first song to be revealed was Twisted Shadows that you mentioned before. And to me, that one is probably the one closest to Hagen territory a little bit, with the exception of the jazzy moments, maybe. Uh, and of course, you have the uncanny Jordan Rudis on that track. So tell us about that one in detail. So I'm very lucky to um, be friends with Jordan. Uh -huh. He's been a massive influence and inspiration to me over the years. So to have, have one of your heroes on a track is, yeah, I can't really explain it, to be honest. So I asked him, um, I assumed he'd be too busy because he's constantly touring and writing music with Dream Theater. Yeah. Uh, but, but luckily, he, he said he'll be up for it. And yeah, he nailed that solo, really kind of laid his trademark sound down there and brought that whole section to life. Um, and there's also Ross, as I mentioned before, he's singing in the chorus yeah. for that track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm in the verses and the pre-chorus. Then Ross was over at my house um, and he was working on something else. I was recording some vocals for him. Um, and I was like, I've got this track. Um, I really think this chorus would fit your style of vocals. Would you be up for it? And he, he obviously said yes. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think he really nailed it. And it totally fits his style of soaring vocals. And he once again, he brought that section to life. Um, but the song itself is probably the most quirky song on the album. And mm -hmm. it's a quirky song quite full throughout the whole song. Uh, throughout the album, there's like bits and bobs that are quite odd and atypical sounding. But this one has that vibe throughout the whole song. Um, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a fun one. And it's got a strong focus on the rhythm and the funk. And like you say, there's a lot of jazzy yeah. moments there. So for me, it's this real contrast and juxtaposition between almost traditional jazz sounding parts with um, quite metallic, dark, genty, meshuggah like sections. Uh, so that what well, that's what I was going for in the song. So I hope it came across pretty well. Right, it did. And the funny thing is that I listened to the track before I knew that Jordan was playing on it. And when the, that solo kicks in, I was like, "There's no way that that's not Jordan. It sounds so much like him." Right? Exactly. Yeah. It's it's just amazing when a musician has their sound, and as soon as you hear one note, you just know that that's that musician, and like he's got that. So uh, that's, that's a real testament to his musicianship and just what he's achieved as a musician. Absolutely, yeah. And Limbo is the song that was revealed, I think, a week ago, more or less. And it's sort of an inflection point on the album. It kind of splits in two, all the tracks. And it has you on lead vocals, too, which is kind of new, at least for me. What was it like for you to take on vocals? Scary, exciting, a little bit of both? or? I'd have to admit, it was very daunting, because I've, I've sung backing vocals before with Haken in a live context, but we've never really... Uh, done it in the studio ross usually layers the stuff um sometimes we'll do some really kind of faint backing vocals in the studio but generally ross would do most of the parts mm -hmm. but yes i've done stuff in a live context but um to yeah to jump head first into doing a whole album um in a in a studio uh was very daunting um but i'm 
ultimately found it quite rewarding in the end because it was a challenge. But throughout the whole process, I learned uh, which which kind of keys work with my voice, which kind of sections, which kind of layered parts work with my voice. Um, so the whole thing was, yeah, it's a bit of a journey, to be honest. But I think in Limbo in particular, that's probably the track that highlights the, the best part of my vocals on the album, to be honest. Um, it generally works better with the kind of softer, more uh, almost like elbow Sigur Ross like sounding guitar parts. Mm. Uh, but yeah, so that song in general was inspired by those bands. Um, and it probably might be considered quite an odd choice to release as a single. Uh, yeah. but, I, but I wanted to basically highlight the contrast and the eclectic nature of the album with those two songs. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to the guests on the album, what kind of direction did you give to Jordan, Connor, Ross, Matt Lynch, Marcos Foley? Were they 100% free to create their parts or did you have a specific uh, way for them to play or sing? So, so with the band, so we have Connor on the bass and Matt Lynch on the drums and I'm doing the other parts and we formed the core, uh, the core band. Mm -hmm. um, and Matt Lynch is just a complete animal, by the way. If people haven't heard of him, uh, they should totally check out his work. He's an incredible guy, an incredible musician. I actually play with him in Nova Collective. Yeah. And um, he just, he's, he's hugely inspiring as a musician, as a, as a person. Uh, so he was the guy for the drums. Um, I, um, for, for the most part, I programmed the drum parts and the bass parts and uh, all the other parts I recorded in the demos when I sent them around. And for the most part, they would follow those as a blueprint. And there were a few sections where Matt would um, say, what about if I tried this groove instead, or maybe I could add this different hi-hat pattern or something like that, um, which always turned out to be amazing. Uh, but for the most part, he followed what I programmed. And the same goes with Connor. He added some spice to certain parts and made it sound more more bass-like and more human-like. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they followed what I originally wrote. But for the other, for the guest solos, uh, I just would give them a section and say, "Look, just do your thing, mm -hmm. just go over it." Actually, with Ross, actually, he um, he basically just sang the melody I gave him and and the vocal part, uh, but obviously did it in his own way. Uh, but for all the other guest solos, they just did their thing. So they, I'd give them a section and say, "Look, just you got free reign to just kind of go crazy and just do your do your jazzy stuff over the top of it." I see. Uh, yeah, but the the one guest uh, musician that I was totally floored by was Ben Ben Levin mm. so I was on he's on the track Lunar Room and we were on tour together and his band Ben Levin group stood in and firstly he's in uh, Bentley by the way oh okay yeah yeah so Bentley were on tour with us and they couldn't make four shows so the Ben Levin group decided to step in and play those four shows and I was watching their um, performance and he just started rapping over the top of this like crazy riff that he was playing. And right. it totally floored me. And I was like, hang on, maybe that would be really cool over this song, Lunar Room, that I was trying to write vocals for at that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, so I asked him if he'd be up for it. And he, yeah, he said, yeah, why not? That sounds really exciting. And he went home from the tour and he spent two weeks just writing a whole bunch of rap parts and um, lyrics for the song. And he, yeah, he took the song in a whole different direction that I couldn't have done on my own. So that was, uh, yeah, really exciting to see. Yeah. And I find that everything on this album is rather unconventional in terms of songwriting. But you just mentioned a track that for me uh, stands out and takes the cake, which is Lunar Room. Because there's a little bit of everything crammed into eight minutes. Uh, the rapping part, the fusion-inspired lead guitar, a lot of syncopation in it. And uh, there's a, the amazing crescendo towards the end, which leaves a sense of something unresolved on that track. Don't you agree? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, that for me is probably my favorite track as well. Um, probably mainly due to the fact that I don't have to listen to my own voice. <laughs> Come on. I just love I love Ben's delivery, and he he also got his wife Jessica, who's also in Bentley, mm -hmm. uh, sing some backing vocals in the choruses as well, which oh. really added a nice touch. Yeah. Um, and also in the middle section that you mentioned, the jazz fusion part, um, Marco Sfogli is on guitar, and he's been oh, right. yeah a big inspiration for me over the years. He's an amazing amazing player, very versatile, but he's he's playing a solo in that section, and then 
it's followed by one of my solos so we're kind of trading off there so that was a really fun part but i see that song in three different sections so you've got the, the first section which is this weird kind of dark rhythmic tom laden uh, part and then it's got that middle section which is like a jazz fusion almost electro section yeah. Yeah. and then you said you mentioned the crescendo part at the end i think of that as the third part or third movement of the song mm -hmm. uh, but yeah i mean maybe it is unfinished who knows yeah <laughs> that, that initially came from another song so i had this other song and this was a small section in that song then i built this whole song around that small part Okay. Uh, so that other song still is unfinished. So I'll be returning to that whole theme at some point. Oh, later. very cool. Very cool. And you mentioned Novo Collective uh, a few minutes before. What's the status of that band? When can we expect something new from it? I think The Further Side is now two years old, right? You have the first album? Yeah. So Dan and I got together about three or four years ago, mm. around about after the, the mountain, around that time. And we started writing music together. And then we ended up releasing it about two years ago. Um, and we began working on another album and we, we got about halfway through it, but then we both became very preoccupied with various other things. So I was obviously working on this album, The Cocoon, and uh, a lot of Haken stuff. And Dan is in between the buried and me and they're very busy all the time touring. And he also released a solo album this uh, year as well. So he was very preoccupied with that. But uh, we've got a lot of uh, core ideas down. I'd say we've almost got 50% of the album down already. Mm -hmm. But we just to kind of dedicate a few months to just finalizing those ideas. And it would be great if we could work towards getting something ready for next year. Uh, but who knows? Because there's obviously going to be new Haker music and new Between the yeah. Very music. But it would be amazing to return to it because for me, that was a, an extremely liberating project to be part of. And the music, even though we didn't play it live, mm -hmm. it's got a special place in my heart. I'd love to one day take it to the stage and play it to people. Yeah. I think there's definitely a, a, a large contingent of fans who are longing for, for a live debut of Nova Collective, man. <laughs> oh, it would be so cool. We tried yeah. to make it happen. Um, and we were thinking maybe the most logical way of doing it would be to either support Haken or support Between the Buried and Me. But mm -hmm. we could make it happen. Um, there's always like some kind of issue like one guy couldn't make it or there was a visa issue but it just wasn't working for us so with the next album we'll try and make it happen and at least then we'll have enough music um, to play a whole show then right and yeah maybe we could do our own show who knows yeah and on Cocoon did you write and play everything on the album with the Strandberg guitars and what was the main thing that attracted you to them because I think you used them exclusively right yeah, so I'm very lucky to be part of the Strandberg family. And Ola Strandberg, who lives in Sweden, um, has been, we've been working together for about five years now. So he, I think the first guitar that he gave me was just before Prog Nation 2014. And I remember he gave me this guitar like two days before we went on this cruise. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I had to like relearn how to play guitar basically because. Up until that point, I've been playing seven strings, and then I had this extra string, and then I, I made a lot of mistakes during that. <laughs> show, to be honest, <laughs> um, that was my first introduction to Strandberg, and I haven't really looked back. To be honest, he's uh, very kind, and he builds me guitars, and um, he he basically sorted me out for the last five years, uh, and I really love them. They're very versatile. Um, on the album, I used uh, about three different Strandberg guitars, um, two eight-string guitars, and one fairly new design from him, which is a Salen Strandberg, which is modelled on the Telecaster. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, and I, I love that. So I yeah. use that guitar for a lot of the crunchy, more um, kind of almost like bluesy, soloy stuff on the album, uh, and that sits on top of the, the heavier more riff based lower stuff which the eight string guitars are providing um but yeah i generally use them for the whole album and i used uh, a gibson no not gibson an epiphone hollow body jazz guitar yeah. for uh, the jazz section in twisted uh, but apart from that it's all strandberg and also a fender telecaster for a couple of little sections as well 
Okay, because uh, you mentioned the tele, and I noticed on the playthrough videos, you have a different guitar than the one I'm used to seeing. It kind of reminds me of the Telecaster design, of course, with that body yeah. there. Yeah. It's beautiful. And he sent me, um, so I saw, I saw like a, a photo of it on their page. I was like, wow, that's incredible. I love, I love Telecasters and they've been my kind of favorite guitar, to be honest, like growing up and I've always loved them. I've got a couple at home. Uh, so when they released that, it was like a dream come true. It was like fusing my two loves in guitar. Um, so very kindly, he sent me one of those and I've been using it for a whole bunch of stuff for like playthroughs um on haken recordings and on the cocoon and i'm hoping to carry that on with the nova collective stuff as well right and i interviewed the john five a few days ago and he's a telecaster guy of course but uh, uh our comment was that when you pick the right guitar for you it seems like an extension of your body and i noticed that with uh, eddie van halen for example jeff Beck, mark knopfler and mm. john five and uh, i think it applies to you as well because you know it fits so well with your style mm. the strandberg ones Thank you so much. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like it's part of me now. I um, I really should just take it to bed with me and just sleep a bit every night, and <laughs> then wake up and just play. It's it does feel like it's yeah, like he said, an extension of my body. Mm -hmm. um, and what makes them so good is that they're very ergonomic and they're very light. So when you're playing them, you almost don't feel like you're holding a guitar. Mm -hmm. It's just uh, yeah, it's almost like a feather, and they're very easy to play. And yeah, I couldn't be happier. Yeah. To be and you mentioned as influences on Cocoon, Prince, Frank Zappa, Meshuga, and others. Can you tell us how each of these guys impacted your formative years as a musician? Yeah. Well, so Prince was mainly referring to um, to Twisted Shadows. Mm -hmm. So that one, I was trying to, with the verses, trying to go for that soft rhythmic approach with the, with the vocals there. So that was uh, where that one came from. But for, from the album in general, the Meshuggah have been a big influence on me. Rhythmically, they seem to have a knack of it's very complicated stuff, but it, it's they make it sound well, they don't make it sound simple, but it's um, it's very easy to nod your head to their music, so they yeah. do it in a creative way that it just implies all this syncopation and groove, which is something I've always tried to incorporate into the music I write. Um, and I think I also mentioned Bon Iver, yeah. As well. Yeah, so he's um, he's an amazing guy. He's really comes out of some some of the best drum production I've heard in recent years. So for songs like uh, Silk and Chains, which has this distorted drum sound, quite low down, and also Lunar Room for the intro part, um, I drew some influence from from the likes of Bon Iver and Bjork as well, um, and probably mentioned Tigran Hamasian as well who's this Armenian jazz pianist. Um, over the, the last five years or so, he's been a constant source of inspiration for me. He, he kind of like takes sugar-like ideas, but applies it to a jazz context. And it's um, so inspiring to, to hear and see him play this stuff. Um, wow. So, yeah, I mean, if you haven't heard him or seen him, I'd totally advise it. He's very, very progressive in his approach to writing, very atypical. Um, but he somehow, because he's from Armenia, he fuses these Armenian folk melodies into these crazy, rich, like jazz tapestries. It's, it's amazing. It's okay. really, really inspiring. So I've been listening to a lot of that recently, um, and that's undoubtedly uh, inspired or influenced the album in some kind of way. Right. Yeah, I'll check him out for sure. Yeah, yeah. And I think the part that screams the most Zappa is halfway through the title track. And, and then to top it off, there's a sax solo in it. That part is, for me, is so left field. How did you decide to incorporate a sax solo on the album? Oh, I love, I've always loved um, saxophones in heavy music. Uh, obviously, King Crimson are an amazing band to do that. One of Dan's other bands, uh, Triosscapes, okay. they incorporate a lot of um, saxophones into this crazy dark jazz stuff. Uh, so I had this section, so I, I always knew that I wanted to record a, an electric piano solo there. And initially, I was going to record a crazy atonal guitar solo over the part where the saxophone is. Uh, but I thought, hang on a sec, it'd be really cool and um, slightly different, so I haven't really done before, to, to get a saxophonist on there. And so I asked Connor whether he knows anyone, because Connor studied jazz 
in uh, Indiana. Mm-hmm. He, he had a few people and he put me in contact with a guy called Adam Carillo and he, um, yeah, he just completely nailed it. He sent me two takes and the first take was just perfect. So I was like, let's just use that one. And then he played the unison with a guitar as well. And then he did these crazy elongated notes with like a delay on them uh, for this weird Meshuggah like riff section. Uh, so all together, it just sounded really out there, like you say, bit bit left field, uh, which is totally what I was going for. And but it wasn't always part of the original plan. It was uh, almost like an afterthought, really. Yeah. After all the all the other guitar parts and drum parts were already recorded. Mm-hmm. I see. And I read, and you just mentioned that before, that there's like a common thread or overarching concept that ties the album together. What would you say is the concept in the lyrics of the album? Yeah, so it's all about, like I mentioned before, those those moments that kind of make you look at, uh, it could be anything, it could be a topic or your life in a different way. Um, sometimes you see something and it's just the tip of the iceberg, but then something happens and you just see everything in a whole different light. So that was the overarching theme. But then I mentioned before that each song has different lyrical themes which connect to this overarching theme, uh, which is more general. Uh, so the song Limbo was uh, it's essentially about being stuck between two worlds and there's a fate that's dragging you somewhere, but you have no control over it, um, which is essentially it's about my granddad who passed away about a year ago. And so he he was in a really tricky situation because he was approaching old age rapidly and his wife had Alzheimer's disease and she couldn't remember who he was. So he was stuck in between these two worlds from when he was and from the impending kind of death that was coming. So that that was the, uh, yeah, the inspiration for that song. And uh, what, what other songs are there? So actually another one, which is, Quite an interesting subject, which we silk and chains. So that one about sleep paralysis. So I used to get this when I was younger. So I used to wake up and be frozen in my really? bed. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah, it's really. I don't get it anymore. I got it for a few, well, quite a while. For a few years, I used to wake up and just be frozen in my bed. So my brain would be awake, but my body was paralyzed for about sometimes up to a minute or so. Jesus, so man. yeah, wow. so I kind of always wanted to write a song about that. Mm-hmm. This seemed like a good um, a good time to do it, and it kind of ties in with the overarching theme. So if you read the lyrics, you can kind of see how they all connect. Mm-hmm. Very cool. And uh, if we can, let's talk a, a little bit about Haken. Uh, Vector was a huge step up for the band in terms of popularity. You played in South, uh, South America and many other places for the first time on that tour. How do you think you're going to top that, and what's the next step for this band? Yeah, I mean, Vector was amazing for us. We um, kind of delved into a darker, heavier part of our sound yeah. and just went for it head first with this one. Um, with Affinity and The Mountain and our previous albums before that, we've kind of dipped our toes into that part of our sound. But with Vector, we just jumped in head first. Um, so it's really exciting, especially taking it to the stage, because generally those kind of songs work really well in a live context. Um, so we were able to play a whole bunch of the album and it went down really well. Uh, and like I say, we went to South America for the first time, which was incredible. They were some of the, the best shows we've ever played. We played to some of the, the biggest crowds we've ever played to and, and met a whole bunch of new fans, mm-hmm. which was amazing for us. Uh, but we're just going to try and carry on with that. We've got a bit of time now before we go on tour with Devin Townsend later this year, yeah. which is going to be huge for us i mean i i speaking personally i'm a massive fan of devin he's been a huge um inspiration to me over the years like the album terrier was probably one of my all-time favorite albums um so to be able to go on tour with one of your heroes is going to be an amazing experience for us and we'll undoubtedly learn a whole bunch of new things and just it'd be great just to see someone like that in action every night um but yes we've got about three months now until we go on that tour so we're going to try and use that time and pen down some initial ideas and hopefully aim for a release early next year. That's that's the loose plan. Okay. Okay. Is there anything already written for a possible new album? And will it also be a concept one like Vector? Have you thought about that? 
Yeah. We haven't we haven't thought that far ahead, but there's definitely some ideas um, that are floating around musically, but we haven't actually discussed any lyrical ideas as of yet. I see. And you're seen as the heir apparent of the Dream Theater throne. Do you agree with that perception? And, and is this something important to you? I mean, carrying the torch of prog metal for a younger generation, so to speak? Well, firstly, Dream Theater, um, for me, were a massive... They were, they were like the band that got me into progressive metal. And just like most of my peers, that, that would be the case for them as well. Mm-hmm. They, they, they paved the way for so many bands. Almost every band that you hear in this genre would have um, drawn inspiration from Dream Theater. So yeah. to even be considered in the same sentence as them is, is massively, yeah, it's quite overwhelming, to be honest, and mm. very flattering. But who knows? I mean, I don't really, if we could even achieve a fraction of what they've achieved in their career, we'd we'll be entirely happy and content, to be honest. I mean, I, I really feel that that era of the big band is almost fizzled away. Yeah. Because Yeah, the, the market's so saturated now. There's thousands or millions of bands all over the internet. And it kind of, yeah, it saturates the market to a point that there, it's hard for one band to blow up and be this new massive thing, especially in pr- progressive music. Yeah. Um, so I, I feel, um, yeah, it's very flattering for people to say that. And I ov- obviously hope we can inspire younger people to play music. That's... That's one thing that really, um, yeah, it's amazing to hear and very humbling to hear. But as for being the next Dream Theater, who knows? Who knows? I guess there can only be one Dream Theater, and it should be Dream Theater, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you just mentioned saturation. I mean, uh, I'm a music reviewer. I write about musical force, and every week or so, there's like three or four bands that I need to check out. So I think there's a new yeah. expression called replay value, which I hadn't heard that before. Uh, you know, in previous years, but now it's a replay value. It's the value of something being played more than once, which is, yeah. I'm not used to that, you know? It's crazy, and it yeah. um, makes it very hard for younger bands, and it's just getting worse and worse. So for we've been going for a little bit over 10 years now, um, professionally. Mm-hmm. So we've maybe just got in there just before this whole boom of streaming took over. Um, but... Yeah, it's very hard, and I think the attention span of a lot of people nowadays in this industry is very short, so if they don't like a song on the album, they'll just switch it off and go to the next band, and then that'll be it. They won't replay it, and then they'll be forgotten about, and it's really hard to get to that point where you're being um, re-listened, I guess, by, by fans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But have you seen Haken's influence on newer bands? And is there anyone you can name that you sort of listen and say, oh, that's something from us that some guy took or some inspiration from us? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, it's hard <laughs> to say. I mean, I think everyone's got their own unique sound. Um, I know there are some Haken, Haken fans that have formed bands, um, but whether they sound similar to us is, um, I guess it's up to them to say, really. But One band that I really loved over the last few years, they're, they're still growing, but they're called Others by No One. Mm-hmm. They're a, a, a small band, but they've been coming to Haken shows for years, uh, and they're a great bunch of guys, but they've come out with this really interesting music. It's got there's Haken influence in there, and there's also some Deer Hunter-esque sections in there. Right. It's really okay. cool, and there's Between the Buried and Me as well, so it's a real cool con- um cool mix of sounds Very so there, cool. there, yeah but there's a, there's a few out there but i mean who knows who knows okay and uh, going back to cocoon do you think there will be a tour to promote it and if so what kind of difficulties do you foresee to replicate the album live and to fill a set list of course ah so i mean just getting the album onto a cd has been a real challenge if i'm honest because i decided to largely do it independently and i um I'm distributing it through a company called Burning Shed who actually distribute for Inside Out. Um, but everything else is independent. So the artwork, for example, is done by us or the merchandise and getting all of the, all of the tracks compiled. Uh, it's been a complete, complete mission up to this point. So then take the thought of taking it to the stage. Um, it's very exciting and I'd love to do it, but um, it's a whole, other logistical nightmare and i think at this point i'm quite not quite ready for it 
and also like you say i don't think i've got enough music to fill out a set list Mm -hmm. so i'm thinking that i've got a whole bunch of other ideas that uh, will will almost be a continuation Mm -hmm. of the cocoon and i reckon after i've done that album i can reevaluate things and if there's enough demand for it um i can look into working out a way of taking it to the stage but it's very tricky i mean there's the idea of doing it but then the actual practicality of making it a reality is um is very tricky very yeah. tricky maybe, maybe on cruise to the edge for example where you already have so many high caliber players you could do something there and you'll probably yeah. be there next year as well right uh, yeah yeah someone, yeah someone mentioned this actually it was a great idea actually because mm-hmm. i'll be there obviously and connor will be on board and Ross could step in and sing on Twisted Shadows. Yeah. Uh, maybe that could happen. And you're right, we are there next year, so we'll be there. Um, and I could just get Matt over from Atlanta. He could fly over. So, yeah, maybe it's a possibility. And that would be the perfect perfect place to do it, to be honest, because um, it wouldn't be a whole tour, so there's no logistical issues. It would just be us playing the songs. Uh, but then I've got to learn the songs. <laughs> Yeah. Another nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> but who knows? I mean, I'm definitely open to the idea of doing it. I would love to hear these songs in a live context. But um, one day, maybe, one day. Yeah. Well, Richard, thank you so much for the interview. Uh, we are closing off now. And all the best with the new release of Cocoon. And I'm looking forward to the new tour with Haken and Devin Towson in the next few months. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. And hope you all enjoy the album. Thanks, man. Thank you. For our listeners out there, thank you so much for listening to this interview, and please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We're going to finish now with the song Limbo, from Richard Henschel's new album, Cocoon. Take care and crank it up! Turn it